Just because somebody is your friend doesn't mean you give them a big responsibility. They might be a very good friend, but not a very good minister. And so, um, so if, if it turns out one of your friends is in a job which they can't do, well, then you have to get rid of them. The business of government is more important than uh, keeping any particular friend. Let's talk about Liz Truss. She's opened up about her 49 days in office. Speaking to the spectators, Fraser Nelson, she reflected, and this, just warning, if you've not heard this yet, this is very buttock-clenchingly awkward. <laughs> she reflected on what it was like to fire Kwasi Kwarteng, her chancellor. You didn't disagree in anything, did you? As far as I can work out? No. Yet he still had to go. See, you know, I'm... I can't, I can't say it was anything but extremely difficult. She can't say that because there is no other answer to it. Um, William, you've written a really interesting column uh, today, which has a great uh, advice given to you by Seb Coe, who I'd forgotten was your, your chief mm. of staff. Um, the bottom line of it really is, why not say if you've screwed up and the fact that you're leaving means you have screwed up at some level, all political careers famously end in failure, there's something misleading, dishonest, and it's provoking if you don't hold your hands up and say, maybe I got a few things wrong. Well, exactly. That is my argument in my column. You know, take the blame and walk away with dignity. And I just thought when I read on Sunday Liz Truss's uh, long essay about how so much of this was somebody else's fault, uh, the establishment, lack of political support, I thought, wait a minute, there's a pattern developing here. This is the second prime minister in the last year where the, it all just seemed to happen to them. It wasn't their fault uh, that they were that they left office in chaos. And it is their fault. Um, it's nonsense that it's uh, an, the establishment or the herd moved mysteriously in Boris Johnson's case. Um, you know, they caused their own downfall. And so I thought somebody who'd been a party leader ought to just bluntly point that out so that is what i've been doing in my column today and is it because you should never admit weakness in politics is there is there a sort of truism there that if she had apologized and said i screwed things up no one would be nice about it no one would be forgiving people would say yeah you did and rub a nose in it so maybe it's all very well for us to say she should show contrition but if she showed contrition we'd see it as weakness and, and pile in on it well, first of all, I think over time, somebody who shows contrition is uh, more respected and can do more with the more good with the rest of their life. But I also think it's just true. And what about politics being, you know, a closer fit with the truth? Um, because that's a, that's a healthier democracy in the end. And I mentioned in my column how, in an extreme case of this, which is Donald Trump, you know, who said it was nothing to do with the capital riots and that he hadn't even lost the election. Um, this denial of the truth is very corrosive because it, it is partly feeding the ridiculous conspiracies uh, that plague public discourse at the moment and these, this, this misrepresented victimhood where people claim to be victims when they've just failed at something. They're not victims in these particular cases. Um, so um, I, I think it, it's a healthier public life and democracy if people say what is true as closely as they can. And that's what I'm asking for in this case. Kezia, do you look back to your own when you stepped down as head of the, the, the um, Labour Party in Scotland? Um, was that a straightforward process? What, what, did you have conflicting views? Was it easy to, to hold your hands up and say, maybe I, I didn't do as well as I could have done? I think I had a very um, unique set of circumstances that I, I walked away on my own terms. In fact, I didn't really tell anyone I was doing it until it had been done and that upset an awful lot of people. It was for entirely personal reasons. I wasn't squeezed out, wasn't pushed out. I could have continued to do the job for a wee while. I just resolved in a sort of Jacinda Ardern type sense that I no longer had it in the tank. And so I think a completely different set of circumstances. I guess where the comparison might be is when you try to define your legacy. And that's what Liz Truss is trying to do here is is to try and tell her story on her terms. And the truth is, it's just far too early. You know, Thursday was 100 days of Rishi Sunak, and by Sunday, we've got a 4,000 word essay from Liz Truss. The timing of it was all wrong, no contrition whatsoever. And it, everything just feels so very fresh. I mean, interest rates were still rising last week because of the cataclysmic economic decisions that she took. Everything about this is tactically and strategically wrong from her own perspective.
Yeah, and it's hard to see where, where it takes. Uh, before we move off this subject, uh, Pip has asked this question, which I think is a good one. I don't know if you're going to want to answer either of you, but I'll put it to both of you. Have you ever had to push someone off the boat like she pushed Quasi Quateng? Have you ever had to, to get rid of someone you were close to um, for political expedience? Kezia? Ooh, probably, yeah. Yeah, and it's actually doing things like that over time builds up a, a, a baggage, an internal baggage within you, which gets you to the point, Ruth Davidson said this before, where you don't really like yourself a whole heap because of the accumulated nature of decisions that you've taken. So absolutely, you could have done horrible things to, to people that I like in order to survive or to get one step further forward. I'd be amazed if William hadn't either. William? <laughs> oh, I've fired lots and lots of people. Uh, <laughs> politics. That is part of the job. However... Yeah. What, of course, is uh, extraordinary about the uh, the Liz Truss quasi Quateng case was firing somebody who had just done what you asked them to do uh, entirely in order to try and save your own position. Now, that is not, I hope that's not something I've ever done. Uh, but when I was leader of the party, I think I actually, over four years, did remove every single person who I started off with, you know, who'd been in the cabinet before. And were you uh, friends with them? Were, 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 you, were there people that you had a personal connection to? Uh, yes, yes. But, you know, you have to act in the greater good. Um, in fact, this is another way in which a couple of recent prime ministers have gone wrong, which is just because somebody is your friend, that doesn't mean you give them a big responsibility. They might be a very good friend, but not a very good minister. And so... Um, so if, if it turns out one of your friends is in a job which they can't do, well, then you have to get rid of them. The business of government is more important than uh, keeping any particular friend. Let's move on and talk about Nicola Sturgeon now. And the question is, is Nicola Sturgeon in trouble? She's ha had quite a rough ride at the uh, press conference yesterday. She's down in the polls uh, after the whole um, gender row. Uh, have we passed peak Sturgeon, um, I wonder what you think about that. Um, Kezia Dugdale, um, do you think that um, that this is a blip because of all the stories that have been in the press recently, the Isla Bryson case, etc.? Or do you think unless Nicola Sturgeon changes her mind, her, her tone in, in, in some ways about this issue, of course, on, on which, you know, there are there seem to be two sides and there are people on both sides, that she is in trouble? So I, I don't think she will change um, her approach to this issue and I don't think she should either. And let me just say at the offset, you know, I, I'm not somebody who's predisposed to, to come to her defence mm. on a regular basis. But on this but, issue but you are? I am, absolutely. Yeah. And I think she's right uh, on this issue. And take a step back for a second. I mean, there are several other countries uh, around the world with combined populations of 350 million people that, that live with a gender recognition system like the one that she's trying to advocate for in Scotland. Yes, she's had a very difficult week. Yes, I think for the first time in her tenure as First Minister, her personal approval ratings have gone into the negative, but most political leaders live with negative personal approving leader uh, ratings for a long time. She's an exception to the rule and has been for a very long time. I actually think the um, the difficulty that she's in over this issue will energise her and, and force her to put her shoulders to the wheel e even further to drive it through because she believes in it. And mm -hmm. she's in a difficult position because she's repeatedly being asked what I consider to be a gotcha question. And she's refusing to answer the gotcha question because she doesn't want somebody like Isla Bryson to become the pin-up for what's fundamentally a question of improving the rights of a very marginalised group of people in society. So I think she'll stick at it. One thing she's got is, is resilience, uh, perseverance, and, and she'll get through this difficult period. Uh, Kezia, I mean, I think there are two different issues, actually. You know, one is that some people have got uh, slightly confused over... Um, what the legislation in Scotland will actually mean. Some people say, well, actually, you know, it's not going to mean the changes that people are worried about. It's 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 just a piece of legislation that, that kind of sits um, uh, kind of independently and it allows people to do certain things. But I think for some people, and again, maybe this is people who are watching from elsewhere in the United Kingdom, it feels a bit, and I might be simplifying it here, that, you know, people raise concerns. Forgetting about legislation, they'd raise concerns about... Um, certain spaces, be they prisons or changing rooms or toilets or, or whatever they are. And then people who um, 
you know, quite rightly are defending trans rights, say, well, hang on, that's never going to happen. You know, it never happens. I mean, this is ridiculous. You know, you're yeah. demonising a, a, a marginalised group. And then it does happen. And, and, and I think some people feel that they have every kind of right to say, well, we told you this would happen and you told us we were mad. I understand that argument if you're presenting it as an argument between two people with really strongly held opposing views. But the reality here is it's not just Nicola Sturgeon saying, mm. ah, that wouldn't happen or that's not the thing you should worry about. Yeah. It's leading women's organisations in Scotland who have supported this legislation. So Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland, two organisations that have existed for decades to advocate for the rights of vulnerable women, women in particular who've been affected by violence, back the Gender Recognition Reform Act. They have been active supporters of it mm. and believe that women's only spaces, sex-based rights can be protected, whilst you also allow other people to transition their gender, that two things can be possible. Of in course, that but, there, but there are some women's groups who, who, who are not, who don't, who do oppose it. Sure, but I think you would struggle to find a mainstream organisation that's represented vulnerable women for okay. decades. Some okay. of the prominent ones you hear from have popped up around this legislation. Yes. Uh, William, what would you say about this? Do you think that this... So Kezia thinks that Nicola Sturgeon's going to bounce back, this is going to re-energise her. What do you think? Well, I hope not, um, because I don't want the United Kingdom uh, breaking up. Um, I, I do think, though, that the, this... Um, this particular argument over gender recognition um, may, may have affected Nicola Sturgeon's popularity in a way that she partly recovers from. But I think the long-term trend is now downwards for her. There is a life cycle to all things. I think Nicola Sturgeon has, has, not, um, has, has missed the moment to get out while the going is good. Mm. There is a life cycle to all things, including political careers, the life of governments, and so on. And uh, the Scottish nationalists are now beginning to lose their way in several, quite apart from this issue, um, their whole approach to independence, what well, is the next general election, the referendum on independence in their view, uh, or is it not? They're starting to get confused and divided about that. So I think they are starting to be on a downward Trend, but maybe that is wishful thinking on my part. Yeah, well, we shall see. Um, let's talk about the ECHR, the prospect of the UK leaving the European Convention of Human Rights because of the Prime Minister's plans to announce legislation that bans people arriving to the UK illegally from seeking asylum. Being much more bullish on asylum could put him in uh, breach of the Convention of Human Rights. So is the solution to just simply withdraw Britain from that convention? Um, William Haig, is there ever a moral argument for coming out of the ECHR, in your view? Well, I think there's, there are plenty of political arguments against it. I mean, remember, there are, um, there are countries that have high standards of human rights around the world that are not in the ECHR, because they're not in Europe. Uh, you know, that are in Canada or Australia or in other parts of the world. Um, so you don't have, morally, you don't have to be in it. It would be a very bad signal, though, for this country if we actually pulled out of the ECHR. And I very much hope that the government can find a way of implementing a tough and effective policy on illegal migration without doing that. And my impression is that's what the government is trying to do. You know, there is the, uh, the threat has been floated of leaving the ECHR, but uh, my expectation is that the government will put together a, um, a plan that falls short of that, that doesn't actually involve leaving the ECHR. But there is an argument, isn't it? If you want, you can, have, you can pick one or, one or two things and they may be, in the end, mutually exclusive. You can be super tough on what you perceive as illegal migration and say, you can't come here, you can't appeal, you're gone. But if you do that, you can't be a member of the ECHR and you can be a member of the ECHR and you can't be super tough on immigration. And it feels that if this is one of his one main five things, maybe dealing with immigration will trump loyalty to the ECHR. Well, I, I think what the government will try to do and the right thing to try to do is actually to, um, to straddle that. I mean, you're, you're putting the, uh, yeah, the legitimate question, can you be super tough inside the ECHR? I think the government will try to be super tough without leaving the ECHR. And that's certainly what I would try it, uh, to do if I was still in government. Uh, the problem has to be confronted. You know, 500 people yesterday crossing the channel 
any government is going to have to really show that show that they, they've gripped this um conservative or labor and so um rishi sunak has to do that over the coming months but i think he will try to do it without leaving the ECHR. Uh, and Casey, where's the politics on this in your view? Because William makes the point that it's seen as a very important issue, this fixing immigration, fixing the small boats crisis. Is it electorally successful to say maybe coming out of the ECHR is actually a price worth paying? I don't think so. But then I, I sit at the other end of the country and I think your view might be slightly different if you're in the southeast coast of England and this is the dominant issue in your kind of political world. It does strike me, though, that this is more of a threat than a policy right now. And it, the lead in time is up until 2024. So for me, it's very little other than red meat for the Tory right just now, a, a body of people that Rishi Sunak needs to, to keep on board. And it strikes me as um, interesting that a story like that would, would pop up just ahead of a reshuffle where he definitely needs to keep party discipline in line. I, I wonder if it might disappear into the ether in a few days' time. Very interesting. Uh, William, before you go, what do you make of this proposed disentangling of various departments and, and, and a shuffle or a reshuffle? Where do you stand on is it a reshuffle or for a shuffle, first of all? <laughs> Oh, I'll take Matt Jewell's definition of a reshuffle. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, let's keep that simple. Uh, but I, I'm, uh, well, I'm hoping it's it's something along the lines of what I've often called for in the pages of the Times, which is to create a department of science and technology with a secretary of state, because in my view, science, tech, innovation, engineering, that it's around that that we can create that's the only way to create a growth agenda for this country so a powerful department uh, like that backed up closely by the prime minister and the chancellor well that would be good news if that happens but we'll no doubt see you over the next hour or so maybe you have the ear of the prime minister some might say william well I, I'm, I'm sure he reads the time and um you know uh, so uh, maybe we've persuaded him over the last few months well listen i'm sure he reads the times listens to you, you both on times radio as well uh, william hay thank you very much indeed a conservative peer great column in the times today uh, scottish labor leader former labor leader kezia Douglas also writes for the times uh, as ever our leaders panel on tuesday is always interesting thought-provoking stuff <laughs>